Good morning, everybody. I'm Jane Wall, Director for Business Development and Membership at the BIA, and we're really happy to be hosting this webinar this morning, discussing patient and public involvement and led by our charity partners for 2020 versus arthritis. You have a proud history of involving people with arthritis in their research activities and decisions and supporting others in this work. Never has patient and public involvement in research been more vital in a world of lockdown and funding challenges to ensure the work funded is rooted in patient benefit. This session is going to describe developments in the charity's research involvement and participation work and how we envisage the future. We're then going to open up for Q&A and a discussion which we hope will enable attendees to share experiences and challenges of PPI in research. But firstly, I'm going to introduce very briefly our speakers today. Firstly, we have Angela Davies from Versus Arthritis. Angela is responsible for the areas of research involvement, communication and researcher engagement. She aims to ensure the charity's research endeavours focus on deriving maximum benefit for people with arthritis and that the charity are effectively demonstrating the impact of research investment. Then we have Naomi Gay from Versus Arthritis also. Uh, Naomi is the charity expert on research involvement, a self-confessed PPI geek and started working in user involvement in homelessness almost 20 years ago before moving into PPI mental health and medical research. Then we have Denise Faulkner, Centre Patient Partner at the Centre for Epidemiology versus Arthritis at the University of Manchester. Uh, Denise is responsible for the day-to-day -day management of the centre and is part of the centre's PPI strategy team. Also we have Joyce Fox, uh, also from the Centre for Epidemiology versus Arthritis. Joyce is a member of the centre's patient and public involvement strategy team. She works with the centre to ensure that PPI is meaningfully embedded throughout the centre and its research portfolio. Then at the star of the show, we have Ruby Vatti, OBE. Ruby has way too many achievements to list, uh, but amongst these, she has 15 years of experience as a public contributor. She's chair of the Wolfson Centre for Applied Research, chair for the Quality and Safety Patients Panel based at Bradford Institute for Health and Research board member for the NIHR Applied Research Collaboration, also patient research ambassador for the BIHR and Bradford Teaching Hospital Foundation Trust, amongst many other achievements. I'm going to hand over now to Angela and Naomi. Please do use the question function to ask any questions you might have, and we're going to field those questions once the speakers have uh, presented, which will hopefully start uh, a useful discussion on this topic. So I'm going to hand over now to Naomi. Naomi. Uh, it's Angela first, Jane. Angela. It's okay, <laughs> thank you. Uh, good morning, everyone. And Jane, thank you so much for, for that fantastic introduction. I'm really excited. I think we've got a really great range of speakers for you for the next hour. Um, and I'd just like to say, I think, for on versus arthritis' uh, perspective, we've had a great year so far with the BIA um, as your charity of the year. Um, and I just want to commend uh, your ability to connect uh, us all together. Um, we're very much in learning mode. We continue to be, as, as Naomi will show you, involvement is our passion, but we're always striving to do better. And connecting with, with you, uh, we think we can do that even more effectively. So although we're only connected formally for this year, we do hope the conversations and some of the ideas that we might spark today will enable us to carry on for the future. So we're going to give you a couple of perspectives of patient involvement. Um, Naomi and I are going to talk obviously about versus arthritis and then our wonderful colleagues at the Centre for Epidemiology uh, will come um, and talk about perspectives and lived experience then. And we hope that there will be some common areas of focus and we really hope that the Q&A is, is a very lively and productive session and that we will spark some ideas. So just to give you a little bit of background about versus arthritis, but I'm aware that some of you might have been involved in our previous webinars when our director, Stephen Simpson, has taught. And I've put the web address there on the screen so that you can follow up afterwards. But just to set the context, uh, we're the biggest public funder of arthritis research. Uh, we currently have about 300 research awards, which amount to about £132 million investment in research funding. And we're quite flexible in our funding. So we fund people through fellowships across all career stages. We fund projects. Some of you will be aware of our focus 
on pain and fatigue in relation to arthritis and um, musculoskeletal uh, disorders. We've, we've currently got a live call around accelerating treatments and we're very keen for industry partnerships in that call. So some of you might be interested in looking at that website already. We also for, fund places, bringing experts together and our colleagues at the Centre for Epidemiology are, are a great example of that. Um, and we're really keen on partnership working as, as you can, I think, see from our, our collaboration with you. Currently, we do about 10% of uh, our project funding work in partnership, and we're always keen to do more. And our colleagues in research are currently developing our vision for the future with our research strategy. So it's a three-year plan to focus on better treatments faster for people with arthritis, and we want to work nationally and internationally to have a greater impact on people's quality of life. Um, so hopefully that's enough to set the scene, and I want to just move on now. Um, and we thought it, this is how we tend to start sessions on talking about uh, working with people with lived experience. And it's about trying to get that common language going from the beginning. Um, involvement, engagement and participation. These are terms that sometimes are used interchangeably. Um, and I'm aware that in your industries, engagement might be the catch all term. But just so that you're aware of what we're going to be talking about today. Um, in our language, participation is taking part in a research study. Engagement for us is more about the information dissemination and working with people with lived experience to disseminate information about research success. And involvement is working with patients, carers and members of the public uh, in an active role um, to prioritise research, to make decisions about all our research across the whole life cycle. So we will be talking primarily about involvement today. Um, but we will also touch on engagement and participation. And if that's not quite your common language, um, just to give you a set in the theme of, of what that is for us. So what we'd like to do today is just start with an example of how working with people with arthritis has made a huge difference to a live project. And then I'm gonna hand over to Naomi, who's gonna talk more about our approach to involvement and how we envisage our future. So we're a relatively new charity. We merged two years ago with um, two charities came together and we had a succession of transformation projects to get the new charity to where we wanted to be. Um, and one of the things we wanted to do was to enable that everyone who wanted to had the option to take part in a research study. We know that research is a compelling offer for people and people are interested. We know from market research that um, having faith and hope in what research can bring people with arthritis is the most common reason for people to get involved with a charity and to donate to the charity. So this was one of our projects because we wanted um, to really enhance our offer around working with people with arthritis. We did a lot around telling the story of our research through research engagement, and we were one of the groundbreaking charities in terms of our involvement plans and participation and really having a firm offer around participation in studies seemed to be a bit, a bit, a bit of a missing piece of the jigsaw. So, what this project was, we called it Take Part, and we're aware of the problem. Um, in order for research to proceed and be successful, people with lived experience need to take part and need to shape it and get involved in studies. And we know anecdotally, we knew now, and, and it's even more pertinent now at the moment in our COVID world, people are interested in participating in research, but we also knew from our research that very few go on to do it, so we wanted to know why. And equally, we have a responsibility to, our, to support our researchers, and we know that they found it hard to recruit to studies. And I think there's lots of research done. I think 45% uh, the MRC found recently uh, of studies failed to recruit successfully. So our project was uh, exploring what versus arthritis could do in this space. Should we have a firm offer that supports researchers and helps our beneficiaries take part, so actually capitalise on their enthusiasm to take part. So we ran a 12 month project. Um, we involved lots of people. People with arthritis were involved from the outset of the project on our steering group, scoping it. Uh, we had over 2000 people respond to surveys and then follow up on focus groups. 
Um, and COVID didn't really affect this project. We managed to get a lot of our insight gathering done before we ha actually have to, to lock down. So I just want to talk now very briefly about what, um, how the lived experience of people contributing to the project actually made a huge difference to this project. So at the start, we envisaged that probably what we'd end up with was some kind of tool, some kind of access point. So researchers could advertise their studies and um, people with arthritis and their carers or members of the public who were interested could come and log on and find out about studies. And that was, that was our impression. But what we very quickly learned through um, patient insight and the views of people directly was that on its own is not enough. Uh, in order for it to be successful, it needed a wraparound. People needed to know more about what participating in studies meant, generally raising their awareness about research, medical research and research into arthritis. And also we were hearing from researchers that they needed help with doing participation well. Uh, they weren't always successful. And another really strong point that came out from our patient insight partners on our steering group was that the quality of experience is all important. And often that's very lacking. It's the reason why people uh, drop out. And it's often the reason why people don't take part initially because information is, is lacking. Um, so we very quickly realized that the tool is just one of other key elements. And we also were reinforced that the charity needed to really firm up on our, if we were serious about this offer, we needed to walk the walk and we needed to make sure that our requirements of researchers were robust and were thorough. So it was not enough to simply build it and people will come. The, the, the people who worked with us with arthritis on this project completely transformed it. And so we ended up with a series of recommendations. The tool was one of them. Um, we are now planning an education series for both people with arthritis and their families and researchers. We have already re, uh, examined our policies and procedures and our expectations of those we fund and we've strengthened them. And we've started reaching out to partners because there's lots of people working out in this field and we wanted to not reinvent the wheel. And our patient insight partners, many of them who are very expert and work on lots of projects, we're able to bring in examples of good practice in the sector and flag that up to us. So it was a really transformational project. Um, and I think we've ended up with a much better, bolder project, which will allow us to grow our supporters. Uh, it will make a name for the charity. And I think it will, the, the most important thing is it will have a great impact for the patient voice uh, in enabling them to go on and participate in studies. So it's been really transformational. And for those of you who are interested, we're hoping that we'll move into delivery um, in the new year. So do follow up with me afterwards and we'll be reaching out to you next year. So that was just an example of how working with people directly could have a real, improve the quality of what we're trying to do. I'm now gonna hand over to Naomi, who's gonna talk more about our approach to involvement uh, and how we envisage our future. Thank you. Hi, so I'm Naomi Gay, Research Involvement Manager. I've just realised I can't actually move the slides, so that's not very good. Um, Angela, could you maybe move the slides on for me, please? Thank you. So there's lots of ways that we know involvement benefits our work, but in order to do that, we actually need to bring about meaningful uh, PPI. So I came up with this handy um, learning device respect in thinking about, next slide please, in thinking about um, how we recruit people, so thinking about how we get people with the most relevant experience, um, the, the diversity of them, so thinking about expectations in terms of being clear what the purpose of the involvement is, the scope of influence, supporting people with the information, the context, the knowledge to really contribute meaningfully. Plan and thinking about how you choose the method of involvement to best get people's opinions. So, you know, is that a focus group? Is that people on steering groups? evaluate to continuously improve the whole point of doing the involvement of course is to change to get that different perspective to add value to your work and last but not least is time to feedback because we know that 
um, the thing that stops people getting involved again is because they don't know what difference their involvement has made. So we really need to make sure that we're continuously um, communicating with people um, to, to know how much we value what they, what they bring to the party. Um, so the next slide talks about how PPIs evolved. Um, so we first started with a really small group of people helping with funding decisions. We've now got a much larger network and we're about to undertake a really systematic review where we get the views of all of our different stakeholder groups to explore how we might be able to scale up involvement, look, brainstorming where it could add the most value through the research cycle and what people really want from us. So the next slide um, shows that the majority of our involvement today, if you just click through those, please, the majority of our involvement today has really um, focused around our funding decisions, um, both in going out to lay review at the same time as peer review and also having people sit on our committees, which has added enormous value in being able to bring insight and change the academics perspective in what how impactful the research could be if it is successful in terms of quality of life but in all sometimes also in the size of the population that might be affected by such symptoms which doesn't always have the um the best data available but as i said this review is really about us exploring with our various partners as well as with people with arthritis all the different areas of the research cycle that people might be able to add value to our work so the next slide thinks about you know we have done some work in different areas of the research cycle to date but what what other ways could we do that so doing the research obviously we we don't do the research ourselves but we fund others to or work in partnership with people doing that but we've offered guidelines and training for our researchers you know potentially we could give people access to our network we've done the occasional project with industry but when we come to this work next next spring what we're hoping to do is really explore what industry might want from us in potential partnerships what capacity that might take from us in particularly how we can staff that effectively so that we can ensure people have that quality experience and industry get what they need from that which sometimes takes a bit more time than than anticipated um, we've also done some work around monitoring and dissemination, so having people speak at all party parliamentary groups is enormously impactful, but I think where we've seen the biggest uh, impact today has been in involving people in identifying and prioritising our research. So last year we set up research advisory groups, which are independent groups made up of academics, healthcare professionals, and people affected by arthritis. Um, three of these looking at different areas in actually identifying where the, the biggest gap in knowledge are in the research community and what the biggest needs are in the patient community and bringing that together to advise us on what the unanswered questions are. We're also, as Angela said, um, developing our research strategy at the moment. So we've got um, people with arthritis on that development group and very early on in the process we're having a series of focus groups with people with arthritis to ensure that that work is really informed by people's experience from the beginning and we also we know that sometimes this involvement it, it's not it's not a structured thing and actually happens in quite a fluid way and sometimes the benefits and the impact comes in unexpected ways so we've also worked in partnership with cancer research uk on a couple of uh, intensive kind of ideation residential workshops which we've called sand pits which bring together multidisciplinary academics and patients to look at um, the unanswered questions in immune research, which has meant that we've, you know, research questions and research has started to happen in areas that no one 
was able to foresee and is really making, we know is going to make a huge difference to people's lives. Um, so the next slide just shows uh, where to go for more support. We've got our guidelines. We're a member of a shared learning group for charities um, doing involvement in medical research. And also um, there's the NIHR website there about where you might be able to find people to involve in your research. Thank you. I think I'll hand over now to our Centre for Epidemiology. Good morning everybody, uh, my name is Denise Faulkner and I am the uh, Centre Manager for the Centre for Epidemiology uh, versus Arthritis based at the University of Manchester. Um, we're a centre of excellence uh, funded by versus arthritis and we carry out research into muscular skeletal disease. Our mission is to address clinically important questions in musculoskeletal disease that require a robust and epidemiological approach, delivering results to improve the quality of life for people living with arthritis. Our research areas focus includes the occurrence and progression of disease and the effectiveness and safety of treatment. Cutting across these two pillars we have three cross-cutting themes. Harnessing digital data, statistical design and analytics, putting research into practice. Embedded across all of these areas of work is the patient and public involvement and engagement. In May, 2020, the centre launched its PPIE strategy, which has been positively received by Versus Arthritis and our external scientific advisory board, who identified this as being a real strength of the centre. Our vision is to be amongst the UK's leading research departments for patient and public involvement and engagement. We aim to position patients and PPIE activities at the very heart of everything we do, knowing that working together, we can make our research and impact better. I'm now going to hand you over to Joyce Fox, our patient partner, who is going to take you through the strategy and the implementation in more detail. Hello, everyone. So I'm Joyce Fox and I work with the Centre for Epidemiology versus Arthritis as the Centre Patient Partner and I have lived experience of conditions researched by the Centre. A key driver in getting PPI right in the Centre is our PPI strategy. The strategy was co-produced by uh, Katie Druce, the PPI lead, Denise Faulkner, who you've met, the Centre Manager, and me. It sets out the approach we will take to ensure that PPI is meaningfully embedded across the centre and its research portfolio. And despite the ongoing challenges presented by COVID with all work needing to be conducted remotely, we've continued to implement the strategy and we are making good progress. The strategy has five sections. The first is culture. So in this, we aim to make sure that PPI is valued and supported by everyone in the centre. The strategy itself supports the development of a culture in which PPI will thrive. So uh, as Denise said, we had an official launch, but this had to be held virtually due to the pandemic. And Katie produced an introductory video to accompany the launch. And we disseminated this with the strategy to all staff and PhD students and also held a virtual drop-in session. Part of our ongoing work is to produce a two-sided summary of the strategy for the wider public. We've also developed a code of conduct, which clearly sets out our expectations for researchers when they work with public contributors. In establishing a culture which values PPI, the commitment of centre staff is key. 
So Katie Druce, the PPI lead, Denise, the centre manager, are totally committed to embedding and supporting PPI. And crucially, it has the full support of the centre director and the deputy director. The senior management team has a standing agenda item for PPIE, and all senior management meetings are attended by me, the centre patient partner. The second section is capacity building, which includes training and support for both researchers and public contributors. All new starters undergo an induction, and we've recently had a new centre staff and PhD students join the centre. And they received a welcome message from the PPI strategy team, along with a copy of the strategy and the video introduction. They will soon receive an in induction uh, which will broaden their understanding, where they'll have the opportunity to ask questions and identify training needs. In order for PPI to be spread across the centre, it needs everyone to understand what the PPI is and how they can embed it in their own research. So it's not just leaving it to individual PPI specialists. And therefore, it's really important that staff have access to training and are supported to do PPI well. Equally, it's important that public contributors are supported to have access to training and to help them in their roles. In December, we plan to carry out a survey to capture PPI activities and PPI training needs for researchers and public contributors. The third section focuses on the PPI opportunities that we offer. We want to make our opportunities accessible and inclusive. We do this by holding open recruitment, not just working with people we've previously involved, and by developing communications which reach beyond existing PPI networks to wider diverse communities. Diversity is extremely important. We aim to recruit public contributors from the population that is the focus of the research study and find people who have lived experience of the conditions being researched, not just someone who has a general interest in getting involved. And we support opportunities across the research cycle, from being involved in identifying the research questions and developing the protocol, to informing the research throughout its conduct and in the dissemination of the findings. The fourth area is public engagement, and we work closely with the Centre Comms Manager using a range of communication channels, including print and online methods, to reach wide and diverse audiences. This is to raise public awareness and understanding, and also encourage people's interest in getting involved with our research. And the fifth section is impact. And to demonstrate the impact that PPI has had and will have, I'd like to focus on two specific research studies. So the first of these is our COVID research. With the onset of lockdown, the centre began working with Salford Royal to develop research relating to COVID-19. We immediately set about recruiting a PPI group and we used open recruitment to recruit five public contributors, including people with different ages, lived experience of COVID, including being admitted to ICU and being intubated, people shielding and people from BAME communities. Public contributors are included in ongoing scientific meetings and help shape the research questions. For example, one set of outcomes that had initially been focused on by the research had included being admitted to hospital, recovering and discharge, still being in hospital or died. However, the PPI group flagged up the importance to patients of more nuanced aspects of recovery. For example, the levels of functionality a person regains. And this has now been incorporated into the research going forward. The work is still ongoing and public contributors are still an integral part of the COVID research teams. The second example is assembling the data jigsaw, which is a 1.5 million pound research program funded by the Nuffield Foundation. This will link existing data in healthcare records and use big data analysis to help answer questions around arthritis. Now, this has just started and PPI and public trust are key aspects of the research and PPI is threaded throughout. So the program has a PPI co-investigator who was involved in developing the application, who is responsible for PPIE across the program and who is working closely with the workstream lead for public trust. The programme is using Salford data, so therefore we will be recruiting public contributors from the diverse communities across Salford. We've started by scoping the different communities and groups in Salford and identifying key individuals who can help us make connections and build relationships, which are key. 
the pandemic has highlighted the need to raise involvement and participation of people from BAME communities, but we're also very aware that this is an umbrella term encompassing many different and diverse communities, and each might need different approaches to engagement, so there's still not a one-size-fits-all. There might be a need for interpreters or producing material in different languages, or materials in audio and visual format in addition to print. It's important to include people with protected characteristics and also marginalised and vulnerable groups. And these are disproportionately affected by health inequalities, so their voices are, are key in helping shape and inform the research. And some people may require additional considerations for support and flexible ways of facilitating their involvement. So recruitment of public contributors for Jigsaw will aim to have a diversity which reflects that of the Salford population. And we plan on using a range of activities to open up the opportunities for different groups to get involved. By doing this, we believe our PPI will have a considerable impact, which we will be aiming to capture and share. So thank you for listening. And I'll now hand over to Ruby Batty, who is one of the public contributors on the COVID PPI group. Good morning. Um, I have over 15 years experience and um, really grateful to be able to support the projects that um, Joyce has um, explained. Uh, I bring in insight, I bring in the lay view um, from the networks that I have. Now, today's session, I'm going to just give you a little bit background about what a public contributor is. Next slide. Now, public contributors can be patients, carers, family members, people who are just interested in research. They come from all walks of life and they're there to support researchers in partnership to help them shape their research project. Sometimes we can come in and support researchers from the light bulb moment as well, where they've got an idea and some researchers do actually speak to research, uh, two patient contributors to see what their idea is, what insight they can bring and whether the project is worth um, pursuing. How do we contribute? We as Joyce and other my other colleagues have um, stated, we, we get involved from the start. We're not just tip box um, public contributors. We are involved from the research for the research project from I would say in every stage, um, from shaping the strategy, from moving the the research project, connecting with the different communities, connecting with the different networks and bringing that insight to support that research project. And we work all the way up to dissemination. Now, how do we contribute? We contribute in various ways. We contribute by sitting on the panels. We sit on committees as advisory roles, or we can sit on the committees to help um, for example, the scientific um, committee to get that insight and give that lay view to support the other people and professionals around the table. We can read lay summaries and give our input uh, to the researchers to help them shape those lay summaries before they're sent for bidding. We plan out research as well with um, the researchers. And it's really important the researchers take our feedback, they value our feedback, and that feedback can change um, some parts of the research project. We also support teaching and training for healthcare students. This can be in universities and colleges. And we also participate in conferences like today. Now, what we offer, we offer, as I said earlier, the lay view, first-hand experiences, knowledge from that population and place. Um, we bring in the diversity. We bring in grassroots soft intelligence, which perhaps the researchers don't have access to. Um, working in partnership with the researchers, we're able to bring in that intelligence to, to give them an insight um, 
and real life experience about a particular project and our voice is heard at every stage a successful research project will always ensure that a public contributor's voice is heard at every stage now what we expect back is really i think it's the basics of courtesy keeping us in the loop and not treating us as a tick box that we've got a public contributor part of the team and that's that's it the job's done that's really really important not to make us feel um we're a tick box and a lot of researchers don't do that uh, a lot of researchers really put us power par with par and around uh, the table we our voice is recognized our, our voice is acknowledged um, and it's listened to um, I think one really really important point is also to be to be open and transparent with public contributors so recognition payments for example travel expenses um, address those at the beginning contributor knows where they stand we don't expect to be paid at all all the time but there are the evolved guidelines to help you to support you to, um, and those guidelines have had public contributors contribution um, to what the field should or should not be paying so it's really important because sometimes some public contributors may be excluded because they haven't got a car they can't get to yourselves um, and they may not even have a computer um so they're, they're sort of things that you need to iron out at the beginning because they help you to get more public voice around the table the key factors for this particular project that i've been supporting um the team with from my view as a public contributor i was able to bring in that diversity bring in the voices of the community where english is not the first language i was able to bring my networks connect the team with networks um, in different cities uh, and it's an important voice and um, joyce has um emphasized earlier about the diversity inclusivity which is so important to make all walks of life because public contributors come in all shapes and sizes we, we do and um, we've got the unbelievable first-hand experience and that experience can really shape um, research projects so i hope that's a little bit background about public contributors and how we do get involved and how we work i mean the most important is the partnership working with the researchers um, the voice that we bring the networks that we we bring in which may the researchers may not have access to and um, together we make that research um, project successful next slide it's thank you very much for listening to me and uh, i think we'll give it back to jen for questions thank you hello and thank you ruby uh, for that really insightful uh, talk and to angela and naomi um, and the crew at the centre as well, really interesting. Thank you so much. There's lots of things uh, cropping up in, in my head as questions. I'd invite the audience, uh, if you do have questions, please do pop those in the box and we will take them. Um, I've got a couple myself. I mean, firstly, um, uh, as, as BIA, uh, obviously we have um, many organisations who I know would be really interested in the work that you're doing. Uh, specifically, I was interested, uh, Ruby, in your comment about how you can get involved in lots of different stages of the research, including quite early on, actually. So, for example, we have many SMEs, many of them actually startups working lots of different areas. How can they go about accessing the, the kind of expertise that you as a public contributor um, can offer? I think it's really, it's linking with each other. Um, the National Institute of Health and Research is a really good starting point where um, they have public contributors supporting them. But it's it's also linking with the trusts. We all, my other hat is a patient research ambassador for the trust and the Bradford Institute of Health and Research. So it's having that knowledge, having that information that um, public contributors 
are either in primary care, secondary care, and linking with those networks. For example, we've got a Yorkshire and Humber um, patient research champions network so it's it's having all that information which is really important uh, because that opens up the networks that you can access so it's where to get all that information from okay that's great um and what do you think i open this up to everyone what what do you think the benefits and risks of organizations collaborating on ppr are in research is that Here we for anybody? Yeah, for anybody, yeah, yeah. Sorry, Jane, I, I'm just aware, I think Joyce was trying to comment on the previous question. Oh, sorry. I think it's hard to watch all the screens, isn't it? I, I, I wonder if, if we could invite Joyce to come back in. Yeah, please do. Joyce. Yeah, just what I'd like to add. Um, so for SMEs looking at um, finding public contributors, I think looking very much at the focus of the research that they've got, um, what uh, populations they're researching, what conditions they're researching. And then looking at the charities and the support groups that already exist that, that support people with those conditions or in those environments and starting to make contact with them, maybe at a national level, or maybe if they want to recruit from a particular region or a locality, looking at those. I, I've done a lot of uh, trawling through Twitter and finding out who's on there and then using those links to find out more about the organization on their websites and then finding the contact people and going direct to individuals who might be able to put me in touch with communities that already exist. And I think also always thinking about bringing people together in a panel or a group, maybe using existing groups that exist and going to them, which makes it more, uh, it's less challenging, it's less intimidating if you are invited to their group rather than them being invited to a panel in, I know it's all virtual at the moment, but when we do get back to a, a more like normal, inviting people to a university or an office building can be quite daunting for people. So going to meet them on their territory really helps to put them at ease and to encourage them to become more involved. I think also to add um, is the voluntary sector is a powerful tool as well. The voluntary sector um, public contributors. Okay, thank you. Um, so really, sort of tapping into those tapping into those networks and and the charities, it's really helpful. So um, yeah, so back to the question that I'd invite anyone to take. What what do you think the benefits and risks are of organisations collaborate uh, collaborating in in this space? Shall I shall I kick yeah. off? I'm sure we all have something to say on this, so I'll keep, I'll try and keep it brief. I think. Um, this huge benefit to collaboration. Uh, we can't do it all on our own. There's a lot of energy and enthusiasm around this. So by working together, I think you you just achieve economies of scale, but you also, you can, you can really spread the best practice and the ideas. We, no, no one organization or person um, holds all, all the answers, but there's a lot of willingness. And I think right at the moment in our COVID world, there is so much, enthusiasm for research you know research is um, on everyone's lips we're all now much more familiar with with research terms than we were and i think there's a great opportunity to come together and capitalize on the interest of the general population and people with particular conditions to really get involved um so i think um i think we can also our, our role really in the charity is to amplify the patient voice wherever we can um, so the more conversations we can broker, not speak on behalf of, but broker, putting people who are interested in our communities with organisations who want to work, is just a win-win because then there will be more patient influence over research, the right questions will be asked, the right studies will be progressed probably quicker and a better quality because the patient voice will be in there from the start. So I think, I think there's huge advantages. There are some some downsides. Um, I think organisations are not the same. Uh, you know, charities and industries work in different ways. Uh, we we have history of, of working with pharma, and we've learned that it, it's it's about setting common understandings. Uh, we may not move as quickly as each other, 
Um, we may have different legal requirements to meet. So I think it's about understanding where we're each coming from. Um, but a lot of these practical things can be overcome. Um, so I, I think it's just been uh, very open minded and being practical and not losing sight of what we're all here for, which is, is a shared willingness to do better for our beneficiaries. Mm. If I could pick up there just to elaborate a little bit more on what Angela was saying about the risks, I think I would say that it's particularly around expectations. I think it can be quite difficult um, just with one organisation involving people with arthritis that often we're coming at it in a very different mindsets and what we anticipate as being obvious might not be and likewise so sometimes the things that you know for example every organization I've worked for the expenses policy is written by the finance team who have a good salary and to them you know submitting it on this electronic form and waiting for it to be reimbursed two months later seems like a perfectly reasonable thing to do but if you're trying to involve people particularly people that might be living on benefits and who might not be you know technologically savvy that's a very difficult thing to do um, so i think there's a real an extra challenge when you're bringing together different organizations to ensure um, that you really all have that shared understanding about what quality involvement looks like and what those expectations are from everyone's point of view. And I think investing a lot more time in that stage, ensuring everyone has that shared understanding will mean that you're able to lever much more impact later, later down the line. Okay. Okay. I Thank think you. for public contributions, I think for public contributors, it's really important be, to be able to um, have that collaboration because you meet different public contributors and they bring different networks and you're able to tap into the different networks and different public contributors bring different insight um, to the table. And as Naomi said, something little has uh, a payment to somebody who's on benefit which will mean a lot to them you don't pick that up until you're collaborating and you're working with different organizations but the insight from public contributors when we work together and we're able to share our networks um to for the organization's benefits the risks are is you usually have, as they say, the usual culprits uh, as the public contributors. It's reaching out to those public contributors where English isn't the first language, where they have a disability or they're blind. I mean, I had one public person who wants to be a public contributor, but didn't think they were able to do it because they're blind. So it's reaching out and bringing those that diversity. Um, and the only way it is working together, working in par partnership and working with different organizations, it makes a big difference. Thank you. Thank you, everyone. Um, I've got a question actually from the audience. Have you been involved with any collaborations with regulatory authorities on ICE? Um, so that would be Would you take that up? Uh, you cut out or Denise thing. or Joyce? Uh, oh, so. Have you been involved with any collaborations with regulatory authorities? No? Okay. No. Uh, it's in the question box. Can you see that? No. Can you hear me now? Yeah, you come yes. back now. Okay, sorry. Have you been involved with any collaborations with regulatory authorities or NICE? Uh, not from the no. centre, no. Uh, yes, so I have. So at Versus Arthritis, we um, often respond to NICE's requests for um, support with patient involvement. So, or as part of their consultation, they consult us as patient organisation. But it's our role to not just give kind of our opinion as professionals, but to actually go out and seek the opinion of people with arthritis to ensure that we're representing that to um, 
you know, regulatory bodies. I've also worked on in the accelerated access review, ensuring that the um, NHS is able to facilitate, or all the regulatory bodies are able to facilitate the speedy uptake of new products uh, and treatments to reach patients much sooner. And actually, working with patients, they were able to identify barriers in the system as a whole that maybe haven't been considered, I think, by professionals. Um, so an example being just the problems in communication between uh, health and social care and then different parts of the health system and the time it takes for rollout of that is uh you know really prohibitive to ensuring even when things have gone through the mir mhra and nice and then you think you've won actually then there's a whole new load of hoops to jump through that the patients were really quite articulate and eloquent in pointing out and helping think through how to get over those barriers angela I think just to add to that as well, as Naomi says, we're we're very keen. We we see a, a responsibility to um, to make sure that our our voices and the voices of those uh, our beneficiaries are represented. So we always try and take part in in intelligence gathering, as Naomi said. But also to point out, I mentioned in my bit that um, many of our patient insight partners are real experts in the area and incredibly active. So we have a number of our partners who are not just volunteering with us and working with us, but are also in their own right working, uh, like Ruby was talking about, on national panels, working with NICE, working with other regulatory or uh, working on clinical guidance. So there's a number of them that are wearing many hats in their volunteering and they can bring that insight and that network back to us as well. So we benefit uh, doubly from that. Okay, thank you. We've got a couple more of the questions. It's always the way they start coming in five minutes before <laughs> the end. Um, I'm gonna go, I've got another quick question on, on uh, regulatory. Um, how can burst arthritis increase involvement and collaboration with regulators such as MHRA? Uh, or, or is it through more involvement with companies? What's your view on that? Oh, that's a toughie. Um, I think we we have a number of colleagues who are responsible for um, being the sector rep representatives and being involved. And so we, we channel a lot through our, uh, our head of partnerships um, and clinical excellence. So that's one route we go. Um, and obviously we're, we're known as a patient, we have a patient network, so that's another route as well. I think we, um, we also work, we're, very, we're a policy and campaigning uh, organisation as well. So that's another route. Often we have many colleagues who are working with the same organisation. So like NICE and the MHRA, and we all contribute a bit. So Naomi and I would contribute from the research involvement. There'd be a policy angle, et cetera. So part of it is, is providing a whole charity approach, but then the other part is the case by case basis. Where can we best influence? Where can we best amplify the patient voice? Um, so there's a bit of a strategic approach and then there's a bit of a, this is happening, we want to get involved serendipity approach. Yeah, I would echo that just to say that as a large organisation, we're lucky that we we do have very good relationships with some of the regulatory bodies. But we also, because we're part of the Association of Medical Research Charities and we're also part of the Richmond Group of Campaigning Charities as well, we also um, are able to not just speak uh, as one voice, but also often represent um, people's views at, as a sector to try and influence regulatory bodies that way. And I think involvement really helps us in identifying not just what are the issues that are most important to people that we should be um, campaigning on and you know working with regulators on, but often in helping demonstrate to regulators the actual impact that this has on people's lives. So some of our patient insight partners have spoken at the all party parliamentary groups on things like 
um, the research environment and the barriers that are put in place and for other organizations that's been around kind of big data or AI which might seem quite far removed but I think by patients speaking about the impact it makes to people's lives it really does um, help I think decision makers think beyond the maybe the obvious and also beyond the headlines to look at actually what are our responsibilities um, to the people we're supposed to serve. Sorry, I just very quickly and also say, totally agree with that, Naomi. Uh, we're very open to these conversations uh, from, from the audience and from the membership. Um, and we have a partnership team um tesco and i know is your is your sort of link uh for this year whilst we're charity of the year but you know i said at the beginning we'd love to have these ongoing conversations so if you have an idea and you think it's appropriate for us or you just want to run something by us please do contact our partnerships team and we can start that conversation and i just want to get in with one uh, last question it was a topic that i was really interested and wanted to bring up actually on data um and your harnessing digital data project and and this is definitely a theme for us as well over the coming year in terms of um sort of data tech within uh life sciences so i've got a question from you and thanks you for asking uh, how can we share our learnings and digital data projects we have done in rheumatoid arthritis with patients and NHS with bursus arthritis. So I believe you and Cameron is with Cohesion Medical, I'm going to say, because I was on a focus group with him just an hour ago. Um, so yeah, we're really interested in this whole data jigsaw and big data analysis. Also crucially, and you've, you've referenced this in terms of public trust in, in data and, and how we can influence that. So so any thoughts on, on that, that bigger picture of digital data and how we can progress that agenda? anybody <laughs> Naomi yes so this is an area I've worked on a lot actually um, so whilst I was a Cancer Research UK we formed a partnership with BHS to create a panel that the Wellcome Trust were able to access to look at the different ways that we should be supporting um, public trust in this and increase education I think it's a really important area for research and therefore for patients and I think that you know at Versus Arthritis we support a number of projects that are looking at big data um, least not of all of course the Denise and Joyce's work and therefore we know that that can only really be effective if if there is the public trust so if people are willing to consent to their data and you know you look at the progress that things like the um, registry have offered in moving moving the knowledge base forward and I think helping patients understand that when they might have seen you know they might until we are able to offer that education to sort of Joe public who isn't maybe in our networks and research aware they might have only maybe read a headline and a tabloid and think that we're selling people's data but until we start that conversation, and I think that's where uh, it picks up a lot on what Ruby's pointing out about the advocacy role that um, our you know, patient ambassadors can play in raising awareness and um, amongst the public for us. Thank you. Has anyone else got any quick comment on that? Um, we're slightly running out of time, but happy to Joyce. Yeah. Just very quickly, um, I think being very open and as Naomi said, the, the thing about public trust is absolutely crucial and the more open and transparent people are in everything they do, um, the more you, you're going to bring people with you. And I think the uh, headlines and uh, articles in the news which flag up uh, issues and problems are one of the things that we do need to overcome. But if we can match that with positive stories, and uh, key things that patients can bring. I, I think that's a really strong way to go forward. I think okay. it's building building that trust relationship with the patients and the team, which is really, really important because once that trust has been est established, then things like data and taking them, I think it's really important when you, you obtain that data and explaining and communicating to the patients about 
you know, how the data has been collated and how the data is going to be used. So the trust relationship is really important. Thank you. Um, and we're out of time, I'm afraid, but thank you so much uh, for this. I've had several messages saying thank you so much. It's been incredibly insightful. And I know there's a few topics here that we'd love to pick up with you and the members would love to do so. So look forward to carrying on the discussion. I'm going to say thank you to, to Ruby. Thank you, Angela. Thank you, Naomi. And thank you, um, uh, Denise and Joyce as well um, for joining us. It's been uh, fantastic to have you here. Thank you to the audience. There are some uh, contact details here. Um, this will be recorded so that you can view again uh, should you wish to and, and also pass on. And if anyone wants any further info, they can contact myself or, or Georgina um, at the BIA as well for further uh, contact details. So thank you very much, everyone, and have a lovely day. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Bye. Bye bye.